Welcome to the On The Trail podcast. For this week's compilation episode, we are revisiting the fish model series, and this week is part one. We have been talking about the Broken Discipleship Factory in our, in our last right. session. Our last session. Our yeah. last... I just series. came from a conference. Yes. Yeah, our, our series. Last series. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so you... you d- Talk a little bit about that in this book, and then you start laying out what does heart-focused discipleship look like. Um, so do you want to take a moment to kind of explore the core difference between the two, and why is heart-focused discipleship so important? Yeah, absolutely. We, When I was in seminary, we were taught that if the church was a factory, its product would be disciples, right? And, you know, I have a lot of friends who are engineers, and one of the things that they, are, they get paid to do is to study products and figure out why they aren't performing correctly. And so the question was, if you're going to do an analysis of the performance of people who have been discipled by the modern church, would we give them A pluses, right? Would we give them Cs? Would we give them Ds or Fs? Well, how is the church doing actually at producing mature disciples? And uh, came to the conclusion based on a lot of Barner research and just a lot of personal experience that the factory is broken. It is not producing the kind of product on a regular day in, day out basis that we would want, nor that we would expect. So it's not enough just to say, hey, it's broken, fix it, right? You've got to have an answer. And so what we've been doing for a long time here at Deeper Walk is trying to create an a model that churches can use, and not only that churches can use, but that individuals can use on their own journey to go deeper in their walk with God. And so this model, in keeping with a lot of other things we do, we, we try to keep it simple. We explain it with the word fish, okay? And that the fish stands for freedom, identity, spirit, and heart-focused community. So those are the four core things. We'll unpack this throughout this series, uh, where that came from and all the rest of it. But that's the core model, and that's where it came from and is trying to fix this broken discipleship factory. Yeah. I. Before we continue unpacking, I wonder if you would tell the story of the well. Sure. Um, I think it, it really preaches. Well, you know, several years ago, we were, uh, as a family, we were taking a a family vacation and mom had brought along these uh, cassette tapes. This will date when we were doing this. (laughs) And uh, one of, and they were stories from the Jesus film, right? Where all these miracles were taking place. And uh, one of the, the stories, I don't actually, I'm not sure if it was on that cassette or just someone we heard along the way, similar to what they were doing in the Jesus film, these people came and... Uh, I, I'm, now that I'm saying that, I'm like, I'm not actually sure it was on that cassette. Could be conflating things <laughs> I could be conflating things. I could be conflating things. But anyway, I, I, listening to a, a missionary story from some organization somewhere in our past. <laughs> and they, uh, they, they went to um, India where they were digging wells to bring fresh water, healthy, safe water to um, the rural villages. They got to one particular village and the well was already there but it was not functional. In fact, not only was this well not, you know, bringing anybody any water, it had turned into the town dump. And in uh, fact, when they started unpacking what was in there, they actually found broken toilets and, you know, just really nasty junk in this. But they had a little meeting and they decided it would be more cost effective to reclaim this well than to start from scratch and, and dig a new one. So that's what they did. As they, uh, as they got started pulling all the baggage, garbage out of this well, they got partway down and they found something that really surprised them. And it was a cobra's nest. (laughs) So as you can imagine, you know, they were a little freaked out and uh, immediately went and called for specialists who came in and relocated the cobras. Uh, Then they continued on down. Probably I would be a little nervous after that, but they continued on down, cleared it out, pressure washed it, you know, and, uh, And when they got to the bottom, they found that the foundation stones around the spring had collapsed and were actually clogging the spring. And I thought, now there's a pretty good metaphor. And uh, in fact, the whole well is a pretty good metaphor for the Christian life because Jesus said springs of living water will flow up from within you. So I think all of us have the Holy Spirit in us. So all of us are potential wells. We all have this when we are when we are functioning the way we're meant to be functioning, the Holy Spirit is flowing quite naturally through us. But for a lot of us, the foundation gets has collapsed. And that foundation is our identity in Christ. We know it's grace, you might say, is the foundation of this whole journey. So that is, what is it that, why am I not experiencing the life God wanted me to? Well, it's because the, the 
spirit is not flowing. And why is the spirit not flowing? Well, it's because the foundation has collapsed. And as a result of that, my life is collecting garbage, right? And it's like I'm collecting stuff I don't want to be there, whether it's addictions or emotions I can't handle, behavioral patterns I can't seem to break. And, and in the same way that it wasn't just one, it, what the well didn't fix itself. There was a team of people that was involved in this process. And I think it also reminds us that it takes it takes a community to see the kind of transformation that we want to see. So you can see the whole fish model in the well story, right? The freedom has to do with getting rid of the garbage and the snakes. Uh, the identity is resetting that foundation. Spirit is the flow of the water from within and heart focused community is both the community that helped to restore the well and then the community that benefits from, uh, you know, this new life-giving well that's been reclaimed. Hallelujah. Yeah, it's a cool story. It is. I'm it like, is. when I first heard it, I'm like, that'll preach, right? That's yeah. a good... <laughs> that, talk about a word picture or a whole a whole story that just, yeah, it's a great metaphor. So um, we love to root things in the scripture, obviously. Um, do you want to unpack the Romans background and maybe the story of how you developed yeah. figuring out the core elements of a heart focused discipleship. Well, so the, the core scripture behind this is Romans five through eight. And, uh, I was asked to go do some training for a group of, uh, pastors out in Oregon. This is probably 10 years ago now. And the, uh, the topic was discipleship. And so we started, I walked them through Romans five through eight and I was asking them questions. So I was like, if, would you agree, first of all, that Romans 5 through 8 outlines what it takes to be a successful Christian? That Paul's point in writing this is that a lot of people are stuck. They're not, you know, they've put their faith in Christ, but people are concerned that they need law in order to grow. And he's trying to explain to them, no, you don't need law. You need grace in the Holy Spirit. I said, so let's look at Romans 5 through 8 and ask ourselves the question, what does Paul say is absolutely essential to transformation as a Christian. And it's pretty clear that he starts with dying to, dying with Christ. Well, dying with Christ, you know, is, is about surrendering our life to Christ, yes. But a lot of preachers never get past that. Uh, and so every sermon is just surrender again, surrender again, surrender again. And I'm like, well, what if there's more to it than that? Because the idea here is that sin enslaves us. And Jesus said also that truth sets us free. Well, if truth sets us free, then the counterpoint to that is that lies enslave us, right? So we look at sin and lies as the two primary things that enslave us and keep us in bondage. And we died with Christ to be set free. So this is the idea. So the first principle of freedom is anchored in this idea that we died with Christ specifically so that we could be set free from all that enslaves us. That means that at conversion, we are given our freedom papers. And now in discipleship, we are learning how to live that out. We're learning how do I actually claim this freedom? How do I fight for this freedom? How do I live out of this freedom? You know, and you think a lot about our own American Civil War and the, the release of slaves and how just because they got a piece of paper didn't mean that the story was over. In the same way, just because we've been granted freedom at our uh, conversion doesn't mean there isn't a process of growing in our ability to live in that freedom. So that's what discipleship is about there at the first point. Uh, the second, second one is identity, and that has to do with the idea that we're raised with Christ. So if we're raised with Christ, why? So we're, we die with Christ, why? To be free. We're raised with Christ, why? So that we can live out of a new identity. And this is directly related to the idea of maturity, because maturity can be defined as acting like yourself while you're enduring hardship well. And so the more that I can act like myself, act like the person God says that I am, that is the more mature that I am as a Christian. So we see once again, I'm given a new identity in Christ at my conversion, in discipleship, I am growing my capacity to live like that person, you know, in more and more situations that it takes more and more to overwhelm me so that I, I don't act like myself. I think Paul put it this way, Ephesians 4.1, he said, uh, therefore, as a prisoner for the Lord, I urge you, brothers, to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. And I think that's another way of saying live your life based on your new identity. Then the third thing is spirit. And again, if you read Romans 8, he goes from all this hopelessness, woe is me, you know, I, you know, I, why do I do what I don't want to do? And then we get to Romans 8 and all of a sudden it's, but there's, 
the law of the spirit, right? And there is uh, the spirit of adoption who is in me and he cries, Abba, Father. And he's talking about how the Holy Spirit now enables us to live a different kind of life. And so we put it the same way. At conversion, I'm born of the spirit and discipleship is about learning how to walk in the spirit. And then we go to the last one and then all of this is done in community. So Paul is talking not to an individual when he writes Romans, he's talking to a community. And we need to be, in the kind of enriched soil that is promoting growth and freedom, identity, and spirit. And so when you put all these things together, you see that uh, these pastors all agreed that Romans 5 through 8 was, in fact, laying out a very clear model of what it takes to live a successful or victorious Christian life, and that it involved freedom, identity, spirit, and heart-focused community. So the question then became... So how many of you would say that your church has a very clear process for helping people live with greater freedom, right? 45 pastors there, not a single hand went up. I'm like, well, how many of you would say my people could articulate their identity in Christ? Let's not even ask if they're living out of it. Do they even know what it is? And probably only three of the 45 pastors raised their hands like, I'm confident my my people know their identity in Christ. And then we said, how many of your people could, let's not ask if they are doing this, but just how many of them could explain the difference between walking in the flesh and walking in the spirit? And again, very few of them felt any confidence that their that their people in their congregation even knew what the difference was between walking in the spirit and walking in the flesh. I said, if you don't know the difference, guess which one you're probably doing? <laughs> and then you get into heart-focused community and you realize all of these pastors were committed to community. They all had small group programs. They all had Sunday school classes, for that matter. They were, uh, but there was no sense of these people being connected and sharing life at a heart level. And so all of these things go together. And I look at this and I'm like, so how how did we get here? You know, how did we get to the point where every church I know has a discipleship program, and yet none of them are using the model laid out by the Apostle Paul? Right. It's like, how did we get here? And that's why we talk about a broken discipleship factory. It's like it wasn't supposed to be like this. It's pretty clear what needs to be happening. So I look at this in my own life. I need to be working on my freedom. I need to be growing my capacity to live out of my identity. I need to be constantly overcoming the flesh and walking in the spirit. And I need people around me who are on a sim- similar journey who so are sharing this, this, this journey together. And that's what the fish model is all about. So that was a nice long explanation. There. Oh, I love it. <laughs> So good. Yeah, I I kind of want to circle back around to then the purpose of this book that you've written. And who who's your target audience? Who are you imagining holding it that, you know, uh, everything that you've just talked about, you can find in this book. So, yeah. Yeah, target audience. I tell people jokingly, target audience is me. <laughs> <laughs> and that is, uh, to a certain extent, it's like I'm writing the book that I wish I had had when I was first starting out my journey. And... I am reminding myself of the foundations of the Christian life that I need to keep coming back to in my own life. But in the same way, then, I'm. this is a book for every Christian who is frustrated because they, they don't know why they're not growing. They don't know what's missing. And the idea is, here's a growth model that can help you um, do an assessment to see where are the holes that are missing in my journey. And if you are in, in like an overseer of of a, a group of people, you can look at the programs you've put together and go, where are the holes? Are we actually doing everything we need to be doing to help people live that abundant life in Christ? Excellent. I also want to circle back around to, at the beginning, I said fish and go fish. And we've touched on fish. You want to touch on go fish? Yeah, absolutely. It's <laughs> kind of funny. I was talking to a man whose last name was Fish when this came <laughs> up. And uh, he he said, so it sounds like what I'm hearing is you're telling people to fish and go fish. And and it's exactly right. The last chapter in here is on mission. And we often at Deeper Walk talk about kingdom impact. And one of the things, having grown up in a missionary family and a pastor family, and, well, my dad wasn't ever a pastor, but he was a Bible professor and college president and missions professor, you know, so having grown up in ministry, let's put it that way. My, uh, one of the things that I uh, realized was a lot of people go into ministry who aren't free and it sabotages everything they're trying to do, or they go into ministry trying to create an identity because they're not actually secure in who they are in Christ, 
or they go into ministry in the flesh, trying to do this through their own power and their own strength, and they don't know how to do ministry in the spirit. Or they go in and they become really isolated, right? How many people in ministry feel completely isolated, like they're in this all alone and they got to carry all the weight all by themselves and they don't have a people? And so you look at all this and say, first of all, we see that if you don't go through the fish part of it, it's going to sabotage the success of what you're trying to do in mission. That's part one. Part two is that we can use all of these elements of the fish model to do outreach, Mm -hmm. right? We can recruit people who are looking for more freedom in their lives. We can invite people to understand their their true identity. We know people are curious about their identity, right? It's like how many people go and take identity profiles online to find out whether they're a dwarf or an elf, right? We can, <laughs> you know, you can, <laughs> you can go and find out, you know, I think people are fascinated with this idea of who am I? So we, we have op- ways of helping them do that. And spirituality versus carnality and how does this work and what do the two bring together? So we can, we can use these things in the way that we do mission. We can use them as invitations, points of invitation, as well as things that help us be more effective in our own ministries. Fabulous. Well, we are going to be going more into Go Fish and Mission in our next episode. So for this episode, Eric, do you have any concluding thoughts before we wrap up? Well, as we go through this series, I just thought I'd warn people that we're actually going to walk through this model backwards. Hmm. And uh, one of the reasons is I, I tend to read books backwards uh, because I, I like to know where the author's taking me and then kind of work my way back and understand how we got there. But in the same same way here, I want to start with mission because I know a lot of people, especially when it comes to discipleship, feel like... We 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 tend to swing to one end of the, the the pendulum or the other. We're either all evangelism or we're all emotional healing, right? So we're trying to show how all of these things fit together. And since I have a more of a emotional healing reputation, shall we say, I wanted to start with mission so people could see how what we're doing does lead to greater evangelism, greater effectiveness in ministry. Um. Yes. Yeah, so you follow you follow up. Um, this these these illustrations saying um, my approach to evangelism came from a fear bond with God rather than the overflow of joy I experienced in my relationship with Him, and I think this is a sadly relatable sentiment. And I just wondered if you could push into that a little bit more. Sure. Well, you know my uh, my walk with God essentially started because I didn't want to go to hell, mm-hmm. right? So. For me, I could relate to an evangelism that said, I don't want anybody to go to hell. We need to tell everybody, you know, how to not go to hell. Well, that's that'll get you so far, right? And that'll get you started. But there's a decidedly scary foundation to all of that. And then secondarily, the way that it was sometimes preached was that you're not a good Christian if you aren't out there doing this on a regular basis. And so I was, uh, you know, when you're a little kid in church and you hear, your friend is going to go to hell if you don't save them, right? And so now I have a fear basis for wanting to share with my friend. It's like, hey, you know, you're going to go to hell if you don't get this right. And I'm your only hope. So here I am, you know, and it's, ta-da. ta-da, you know, I am here to rescue you. And realizing I didn't know what I was doing. They didn't really fully appreciate what I was doing. And there was a, uh, you know, and by the time I got into high school, my own journey was of trying to figure out why do I believe what I believe? Am I just inheriting my parents' faith? Uh, had a lot to do with, well, I have seen demons submit to the authority of Christ. And that was part of the foundation of my faith. And so when I started to explain why I believe to my friend, I found myself talking about the authority of Christ over demons <laughs> and realizing this is probably not connecting. You know? So it was, uh, uh, yeah, that, the, those early days were not we're not good. It wasn't an, honestly until I was a pastor sitting down in a counseling context and being able to share Christ as good news, right? For the problems that they were bringing to me that I actually was able to lead someone to Christ for the first time. And that was, uh, and I think by the, in the seven year period, there were probably 25 to 30 people that I was able to, you know, walk through that, that doorway into a, saving relationship with Jesus. And each time it's because they were looking for answers and I was able to provide them answers they were looking for. And so that's a big reason why I'm excited about this model and its application to the evangelistic process is that I found in the way that I explained Christianity to these people, I was relying heavily 
on the uh, principles in this model. I didn't have the whole model built out then, but the principles were already beginning to form. Mm-hmm. So you, you said in the last episode how um, a lot of people know you for your emotional healing side of discipleship. And so you wanted to start with mission as a, but also mission, <laughs> you yes. know, you wanted to, you wanted to swing. Not the just an afterthought that we're going to tag on to the end, right? Right. But it's so important. And um, I would just love for you to unpack how the fish heart heart focused discipleship model applies to mission. And we could start with freedom. All right. Yeah. Well, and uh, so when I think about freedom, you think about how many people in the world today are broken and are looking for answers for their own issues. They're, they're, they're stuck in addiction. They're stuck in anger. They're studying with their eating disorders. They're stuck with all kinds of things and they're looking for answers. They're looking for hope. And they come too often, they come to the church and what they get is, well, that's a sin. Stop it. Right. Or they get, well, just change the way you're thinking about this. Um, or they get solutions that are offered that don't actually help them. And so they feel like, okay, I'm in, there's no place for me here. Or more and more what we're seeing are churches who just welcome everybody in with no, but they still have no solution to help them change. It's like, well, come on and be part of us and and we'll accept you here. Well, that's better than the first one, but it's but that's not what Christianity is supposed to be about. Christianity is supposed to be about transformation. So we are uh, finding ourselves, uh, when it comes to freedom and evangelism, uh, I've seen many churches that have had tremendous success, if you will, in reaching the lost through their recovery programs, through uh, the, the things that they do to meet people in their brokenness and their woundedness. And I think that that's part of it, right? We can reach out to people who are in need if we are, as a church, are already um, well-practiced in helping people who have these kinds of needs. So that's the simplest, most straightforward way I can think of that freedom connects to evangelism and helps us do that work. The other part of it is that I've seen a lot of people, including myself, I, I was out there as a little kid and as high schooler trying to do evangelism, but I wasn't free. And not only was I not trained, I, I had my own I had baggage that was keeping me from doing what I needed to do. In fact, I think I remember uh, one pastor well-known for evangelism who said that uh, he was so discouraged in his own walk with God that he found himself sharing the gospel with somebody. And in his mind, he's thinking, you don't really want to do this, do you? <laughs> You know, which is, I think a lot of us can relate to because we're struggling so much inside and uh, that freedom is an important part of this, both in what we are offering to people and also, and we have to be growing in that area in our our own lives. Mm -hmm. How about identity? So similar thing. One is we have people who are looking for an identity and uh, we have a very identity oriented culture and uh, a lot of people... Uh, are having an identity pushed on them at younger and younger ages. And we have, uh, in our churches, we are not always as good at giving people a sense that we have an identity that comes from the kingdom of God. And that we have this this huge identity. It's, in fact, a lot of us have more sense of identity from being an American Right or more sense of identity from which political party we're part of, or which identity we have from our, you know, you you name it. We we have smaller and smaller groups that we're we get our identity from. But what we're trying to do is help people think of themselves as I am a stranger and an alien here. My home is in heaven. I am a child of the King, and my whole identity is flowing from this kingdom source. And so a huge part of discipleship is making sure that people are really well-trained and well-grounded in the identity that helps them to be salt and light in the world. And you thought, think about it, if I'm a citizen of the kingdom, then I am automatically an ambassador here. And so my identity, my kingdom identity is automatically going to direct me towards ministry. It's automatically going to direct me towards mission and towards reaching people with the good news of the kingdom right? That there, that there is something out here. So my identity motivates my mission. It's also part of what I am offering to people is the opportunity to have an identity that is eternal, an identity that matters right for eternity, an identity that sets them apart and uh, and calls out what is truly special about them. And that what is truly special about them is what God has uh, called them to be in Christ. 
Mm-hmm. So we're doing mission out of our true identity. We are doing mission out of our true identity. <laughs> and calling people to their true identity. I love it. How about spirit? So I, again, I look at this like I've heard multiple stories of people who uh, uh, about how learning to listen to the voice of God led to uh, directly to evangelism. Like I know one person who was pumping gas. And the thought just came to them, you should tell this person about Christ. And they're like, I don't know this person. I haven't met any person. This would be a super awkward conversation. But they couldn't get away from the idea that the Holy Spirit really wanted them to engage. And so reluctantly kind of opened that door a little bit and tiptoed in. And to their surprise, the person responded. And before they left the gas station, that person had prayed to receive Christ. They were actually thinking about it when they pulled up at the gas pump. Like, I'm thinking that I need Christ in my life, but I don't know anybody who can, you know, and and the Holy Spirit, I I sometimes think of the Holy Spirit as like a a traffic, you know, traffic controller and that, or a logistics person. We got to get this package to that location. We need, I need somebody who can take it from here to here, you. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of times the Holy Spirit doesn't tell us why he wants us to do stuff, you know, but we, but as we are walking in the Spirit, as we're learning to pay attention to those promptings, it's amazing how often He wants to put us in a position to touch somebody's life that we weren't even looking to touch. Um, and that only happens if we are are discipled and trained on how to walk in the Spirit instead of the flesh. And the whole idea that there are thoughts in my head that aren't coming from me, that might be coming from God. It reminds me of, of uh, friends that we've had in, in closed countries where it's dangerous to evangelize who uh, rely very, very much on listening to the voice of God because you can't just walk up to anyone yeah. and say, hey, Jesus. Um, yeah. That, right, well, our um, uh, our pastor told a story about uh, somebody in a closed country, and he asked them, said, uh, so what percentage of people that you share Christ with say yes? And their person said 100%. He's like, uh, let me rephrase. <laughs> you know, if you share Christ with ten people, how many of them say yes? He goes, I understood the question. <laughs> mm-hmm. He goes, but evangelism here is not like evangelism in the United States. You just don't just stand on the street corner and pass out tracks, right? You can get arrested for that. I said, we only share Christ with the people the Holy Spirit tells us to share Christ with. So if I go to share Christ with them, I know that's because this is a Holy Spirit appointment, and this is somebody who needs what I what I am offering, and so. I'm like, what a, a really different way of looking at evangelism mm-hmm. from sort of like, well, if I share with 100 people, percentages say 20 of them will say yes, right? It, it, this is more of, God, what do you want me to do? What is the the leading of the Spirit in, in, in this? And so it's just a very different lens through which to look at the task of uh, of evangelism. Now, it still calls for a lot of courage. Because he doesn't always ask us to do easy things. He doesn't ask us to do things that look sensible sometimes. Um, but that's uh, so that, that that's a big part of it. And then the other side of it, in terms of what we are offering to people, is this idea that there is a source of wisdom and power and relationship with God. Like, how do we experience our relationship with God? Well, we, we our, our relationship is confirmed in the covenant, but the experience of that relationship is primarily like the Holy Spirit. And so uh, letting people know that a, that a relationship with God through the Holy Spirit is possible is one of the offers of evangelism. Mm-hmm. Well, and, and we could go off, but the uh, on the flip side of wisdom is also the power that you mentioned, which I know there are a lot of stories of Holy Spirit power in evangelistic settings that the miracle is what helps bring people to Christ. Yeah, no, there's no question about that. There is such a thing as power evangelism, right? That Which is, uh, as my dad used to teach a course, your grandfather, right? He used to teach a course at Trinity on a power encounter in the mission field. So he had a whole course just on this idea of how most people in who are following foreign gods are following those gods because they have seen acts of power done in the name of that God. They know there's power there. What they're not sure of is whether or not there's actually power in Christ or whether there's just talk. Because they know missionaries can talk. What they don't know is, do you have any power? And so a lot of times there are these contests of power that take place. And so part of being led by the Spirit is also knowing when to step into these and then having the confidence that when you do step into them, it's because, you know, God's God's going to show up here and do something. 
Yeah. All right. Apply the fish model to heart-focused community and mission. Yeah, <laughs> and mission. So we're going to take the uh, heart-focused community part of mission. And, and you think about it this way. Uh, churches have realized for a long time that it's very difficult to invite someone to church if you don't even like the church. <laughs> And I think we've all been there at different times where it's like, I'm not sure I'd invite anybody here. I was like, I go, we got a commitment and loyalty, but this doesn't really feel like the sort of place I'd want to invite somebody to. So there's that element of it. There's also, though, this idea that do I have a group of people that collectively I would be happy helping people get connected to because I know that um, if they could meet my friends, it would help them on their journey. Oh, that's that's huge. If I know that I'm not in the evangelistic task alone, because right? this is just about me coming up with the right argument or the right formula, or the right strategy to get this person to, to Christ. But I'm actually uh, have friends I can, you know, invite them to meet. And uh, there's more going on here. Also is the idea that that if I am in a community like this, I am more apt to do evangelism. I am more apt to actually share my faith with other people when I know I am not alone. And so it works uh, uh, both ways as well. And I would say that most of the people who've had a, a high level of success in their evangelism are in a small group of people who are also highly committed to freedom, identity, spirit, and you know, reaching reaching the lost through through those methods. Mm. So I want to shift us now to looking at joy and joy's role in mission and all of that. I, yes, we've talked a bit about joy in, in our Yeah, we have. Well, and joy, you know, is one of the elements that, uh, like Jim Wilder and Michael Hendrick in their book, The Other Half of Church, they mentioned joy as one of the four components of healthy soil, healthy community that need to be there. And so we take this the next step, and that is, well, the opposite of a fear-based approach Mm -hmm. to evangelism would be a joy-based approach to evangelism. So the question becomes, what would that look like? And how might we do that? Not only where I am sharing and doing evangelism out of my own joy, but what if what I'm offering to people is joy? And so I was thinking, and I actually talked to a, a pastor about this, and he told me that he was taking the three books, right now there's two, right? That Chris Corsi and I have written, The Four Habits of Joy-Filled Marriages, uh, the Four Habits of Raising Joy-Filled Kids. And we just turned in the manuscript for another one called The Four Habits of Joy-Filled Living. What was the name of it? Yeah, The Four Habits working of Joy-Filled. Yeah, it's a working <laughs> title, The Four Habits of Joy-Filled Living. So uh, he's already told us that his, his plan is actually to offer courses and outreach into his community because these books are not Bible forward. They're brain science forward. And so he, he's planning to use these for evangelism. And that is... Here, you folks in the community, if you want more joy in your marriage, the church has something to offer. If you want to raise more joyful kids, the church has something to offer. If you yourself would just like to be a more joyful person, right? The church has something to offer. And I've often thought, what would it, how would it change uh, if every church in America could become a joy center, right? That is, what if every church in America be, could could become a place where everyone in the community knew that they knew how to live with joy and they knew they could train other people how to live with joy. And I'm thinking if I connect to a group and I have joy in that group, then I am suddenly way more open to everything else they have to share. If I feel a joyful connection with these people and they're helping me live with more joy. So I, I do think that part of what, uh, you know, Chris and I did in writing these books is I'm not sure we even fully grasped it when we first wrote them. We knew there was an evangelistic use for them, but hadn't fully thought that through till this pastor said, well, that's how I'm using them. And I'm like, that is so brilliant. You know, we really, uh, I think we're onto something here if we could get uh, churches really around the world doing something like this. Well, and it ties right into the heart-focused community aspect of FISH and, and that it's not just about growing together in in community, but it's also about reaching out in community and reaching out in joy and not toxicity or shame right. or, you know, whatever negative things we're carrying. But if we can get our healing and our joy and build joy strength together and then share it with others. It's, yes. Yeah. I love let's it. Fancy. Yeah. Uh, you know, joy is a much easier sell than uh, fear. <laughs> and I think too, that 
you know, joy keeps the motivation for what we're doing high. Uh, I, I, Dr. Wilder has often said that uh, um, joy is the number one motivator in the world. When we can't get it, we'll settle for fear. Uh, but there's too many of us who our whole lives are being run on fear. And uh, so let's face it, we're going to have more more podcasts on joy coming up, I'm sure, in the future. But uh, in the we context will not of, stop talking about yes, it. <laughs> in the context of evangelism, this is where it fits. Awesome. Well, our next episode, we're going to be talking more about chesed community. Chesed, all yeah, right. Yeah, heart-focused community. Um, but is there anything that you would like to say to close out this episode? Well, you know, Christ, I think he taught what I call four kingdom values. I remember doing a sermon series a long time ago on the Sermon on the Mount and said, this is his kingdom theology. And out of this kingdom theology comes four core values of kingdom people. And the first one was salvation. And the idea was there is nothing more important than making sure you get into the kingdom, right? That's core value. Number one of the kingdom is we've got to let people know the good news that they can have eternal life in Christ, that they can be citizens of the kingdom of God, that this whole kingdom reality is is out there and can be theirs. The second is stewardship. And this is the idea of God has entrusted me with certain gifts and talents, and I want to use those for kingdom purposes and to reach people you know, with kingdom, good things from the kingdom. The third was spirituality. And this is kind of like the vine and the uh, the vine and the branches, and the idea that as the life of Christ flows through me, then it enables me to be a better steward. I'm not doing it in the flesh. I'm doing it in the spirit now. It also allows me to do evangelism through the power of the spirit. And so they work together really well that this spirituality of life in the spirit flows into my stewardship and flows into my my outreach to people for the kingdom. And then the last uh, core value is servant love. And servant love is the idea that we love even our enemies, according to Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. So what is that all about? Because that's what kingdom people do. That's who we are. That's how we live. And so this is why it's so crucial and why discipleship always leads us to loving our neighbors. And if we love our neighbors, we want them to know about the kingdom, right? So it all fits together. And so I'll close with those four core values. Awesome. We just got a sermon in like two minutes. I I want you to spend more time on that sometime. Anyway, that was lovely. Thank you. Well, today we're talking about heart-focused community. Too many of us don't think of relational joy when we think of discipleship. We think of discipline, maybe. That's yeah. right there in the word. Um, but the heart-focused discipleship model is a growth model, and we grow best in an environment of joy. Um, I'm interested in hearing some strategies for people to find or to not be stuck in an, in isolation or toxicity. Um, and I know you've really appreciated the book, The Other Half of Church by mm -hmm. Michael Hendricks and, and Jim Wilder. I think we've talked already about their analogy of comparing community to soil in previous mm -hmm. podcasts. But um, do you want to walk us through their four key elements of the kind of enriched soil that catalyzes growth? Yeah, absolutely. I think, uh, you know, Michael Hendricks used a uh, analogy in, in their book that jumped out at me, and it was about growing tomatoes. And he said one year he grew a tomato plant and took a lot of time and energy to make sure that it was properly nutrient dense. You know, I don't know if it's just miracle grow. What you put into that stuff, I'm not a gardener, but he put a bunch of this stuff in there. And he got these amazing tomatoes. Well, the next year he planted the tomatoes again, but he was like short on time or something. Didn't do nearly what he should have done to prep the soil. And you could sell it in the in the in the product, right? The final tomatoes that came out were nowhere near as juicy and fresh and and all the rest as the other ones. And there's an analogy. The analogy he pulled out of that I thought was just spot on, and that is that. Most of us, if we look back in our lives to when we grew the fastest or the most in our walk with God, it was when we were in a community of friends where we felt like we were part of a group and there was a lot of joy in that group. There was a lot of uh, sense of belonging, in, you know, like these are my people. And uh, he himself told the story of being in a group like that, growing quickly, and then going through what he called a 20-year lull, right? Which I think on hindsight, he realized during that 20 years, he wasn't in that kind of community. He was not 
in those types of relationships. They didn't have that kind of belonging. And I think most of us can relate to that, that when that if we look back to when was my favorite time to be a Christian, right? When was it the most energizing to be a Christian? It was when I was part of a people or a group, and there was just a lot of energy in being a part of that people. And that's what we want to talk about here. So I think you specifically asked me about the four elements of their soil, yes. right? Well, so I got off on that. Sorry. But uh, so here's the four elements. Uh, the first one is joy. Right. And it's this idea that I enjoy being with people. And one of the ways that you know that you are enjoying being with your group is that you spend time together outside of the assigned times to be together. So like if I'm in a small group and the only time I ever see them is on small group night um, versus groups I've been a part of where some of us would get together together to play volleyball or some of us would get together to go shopping or some of us would get together for something else. If you find you have to find yourself spending time with people outside of group time, that means that I enjoy being with these people. There's an element of joy in, involved in that community. So that's the first, uh, the first part of it. In fact, I was just talking to um, a friend down in Texas who just did his doctor of ministry uh, on the idea of joy in discipleship. And he was trying to measure do people grow faster when there is joy as part of their discipleship journey than they do when there's not? And he came to the conclusion, absolutely. People grow faster when there's joy. Uh, joy fertilizer. Yep. When there is joy fertilizer, people, uh, it's a catalyst to our growth. So that's the first core element. The second one is, uh, you'll like this because you've been, it's been taking Hebrew, right? It's the uh, Hebrew word chesed, which I thought was interesting. So chesed, I got I to gotta put a little caveat here. So that there are two Hebrew letters for H, right? One of them is soft, like, and the other one is rough, like, right? Like the back of your throat, guttural. So most people like to say the second one, you know, and it's just more fun. But the, uh, but to, to distinguish those, when you write them into English, the first one is usually just an H and the second one is either an H with a dot under it or it's a CH, which is confusing because we don't say for CH, we say CH. And so it's just confusing. So you'll sometimes see chesed written H-E-S-E-D and sometimes C-H-E-S-E-D, just for those people who are like, you know, it bothers them that this is, you know, I just want to make sure that people know I understand my Hebrew. Or we didn't misspell this word. You know, I know what, what's going on. So the, uh, <laughs> uh, but chesed is a fascinating word. It's probably the definitive word of the character of God. And when the Old Testament wants to define who God is and what his character is like, chesed is the go-to word. And it has been translated a variety of different ways. But the way I would explain it is this. It is this sense that because you are my people, I'm going to do good to you. I can almost hear the Godfather, because you're one of us. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know I'll, I'll take care of my own. You know what I'm saying? Oh, so. <laughs> Now, I don't think that that's core to God's character. He's not, you know, Don Corleone. But he is a, uh, but what happens though is there's a element, uh, how do you say, there's an echo of it even in that. And it's this idea that says, well, because you're my daughter, there are good things I will do for you that I wouldn't do for just anybody. And so the first time that we see chesed in the Bible is in Genesis, and it's where Abraham's servant is negotiating to have Rebecca come marry Isaac. And once Rebecca has essentially, you know, there it, the question is on the table and he says, so are you going to show me chesed or not? Right. When his point here is, are you, you know, a good family would say, yes, you know, that's what we do for each other. And so there's this chesed idea. So the idea of finding God is that he takes care of his people. You can count on him. You can trust him. Uh, that he has, and it's an attachment based word because we have this attachment, because we have this bond. And what's interesting is God is often bonded to us more deeply than we are bonded to him. And, but he still treats us out of his attachment love. So you might define chesed as attachment love. Now we take this and we circle back to it as a quality of a small group or, or, or my people. And what we're talking about is a highly bonded people. We're talking about people who really are, um, they have a, a deep bond with each other. Well, how do you form deep bonds with people? You have to have two key ingredients. You have to have empathy, uh, vulnerability, and empathy. So if I'm vulnerable with you, 
but that vulnerability is not met with empathy, then I'm not going to be vulnerable anymore. And uh, on the other hand, uh, I can invite people to be vulnerable, but I'm never vulnerable myself. That doesn't work either. So, so what happens is that groups bond as they are vulnerable with their weaknesses, and those weaknesses are treated gently and like protectors. If I am... Uh, the other thing that grows bonding is going through hard things together and getting through on the other side, right? And so you're like, ah, oh, yeah, I remember when we all had to face this. Or it could be as simple as we had final exams and yay, we made it through, <laughs> right? <laughs> to uh, it can be little things. It doesn't have to be we we fought World War II together, right? It can be uh, anything on that scale. But you can know how bonded military units are because they do hard things together and they overcome things together and it, it just does something to bond you. So they it's built the, trust and you they've... build trust, right? So there's this that's chesed, right? Chesed is that we are tightly attached together. Um, yeah, I heard the motorcycle too. So we have a uh, <laughs> that's all right. We'll get by. The uh, uh, that's the idea of chesed is that we do good to each other because we know that we belong. Um, the next uh, core element is group identity. And what comes out of the belonging is identity. So in the book that I wrote with Jim Wilder is called Solution of Choice, right? we talk about this model that says belonging plus identity. It's also in rare leadership. That belonging plus identity uh, equals transformation. And so the idea here is that if I'm in a group where I know I belong, and I'm thinking if, if you were going to have a substitute word for chesed, it would probably be belonging. Mm-hmm. So joy, belonging, identity. I know who I am because I know who my people are. And so my people are the sort of people who handle problems this way. My people are the sort of people who treat weakness this way, right? My people are the sort of people who treat our enemies this way, right? So all of these statements about who are my people and how is it like us to act are identity statements. So a group identity is this idea that, all right, we have joy in being together. There's a sense of belonging with each other. I know these are my people. And coming out of that, it's a clear set of values and a clear set of it's like us to do this. It's just who we are. It's what we do. And uh, and then the last one, the fourth element, there is um, shame, but it is a healthy shame. Now, for some people, that's an oxymoron, right, because they think all shame is toxic, Uh, But one of the things uh, in talking to Dr. Wald, I heard him say about this was that um, the right side of your brain, when we experience shame, it's more of a reactionary thing. It's not until it gets to the left side of our brain that when we attach a narrative to it, that it becomes toxic. So it depends on the narrative that is attached to our shame, whether or not it's toxic. And in this case, what we're saying is that in a healthy community, in a heart focused community, I need to be able to say hard things to you. You need to be able to say hard things to me. Right? It's not enough for us just to be happy all the happy all the time. It's a happiness that can get through hard things together, but it's also a, a joyful connection that is we have a strong enough relationship for me to tell you hard things. So one of the tools that we use for this and that we explain in rare leadership is the envelope conversation of make the relationship more important than the problem. Start with your relational history, explain the the problem, and state your hope for a positive relational future. So let's keep the relationship bigger than the problem. That's the essence of we have to have a group that knows how to deliver a healthy shame message. And uh, the definition of a healthy shame message is one that keeps the relationship bigger than the problem. So those are the four core characteristics uh, as uh, I understand them, as they were taught in uh, uh Michael Hendricks and Jim Wilder's book, uh, The Other Half of Church. Yeah. Let's let's camp out a little bit longer on this idea of weakness. Um, at the heart of building a healthy group identity is um, how we view weakness and how we treat it. Can you unpack that? Yeah. When I think of weakness and group identity, my mind immediately goes to locker rooms, probably because I played about six different sports growing up and uh, spent a lot of time in locker rooms. But you know when the leaders on a team are bullies, and when the leaders on a team are protector leaders, because protector leaders, when they have weak members on the team, come around those guys and they don't let them stay weak. They do what they can to help them get better. Whereas bullies actually have a vested interest in keeping them weak. 
Now, they may say, I'm trying to toughen you up, but really what all the bullies interested in is making sure they stay at the top of the pecking order. So you cannot grow healthy community, right? You can't have a heart-focused community if you are brutal to weakness, right? You have only to have a heart-focused community, you have to be gentle with weakness. So I think, for example, using, same with the locker room idea. When I was in college, um, I love basketball, played basketball my whole life, but they had a requirement at uh, this college that you had to run three miles in under 21 minutes before you could go inside to the gym. Hmm. Well, first of all, I almost never ran three miles consecutively in my life. You know, I was usually just a gym rat. I ran around a lot, but, you know, just going and running was not my thing. And then secondly, uh, doing it at that kind of pace wasn't something I was used to. And so the first couple of times I went out, I did, I wasn't even close, right? I was running in 22, 23, 24 minutes. So the guys on the team, though, they didn't just shame me into it, but they gave me a healthy shame message. And essentially, you know, you got to do this, but we're going to help you. And so four of them said, let's go run this together. And just stay with us, right? And just, just just talk our way through. Let's just run it together. Don't even think about the time. Let's just hang out while we run. Let's get through it. I ran it in 18 minutes, right? I was like I was, <laughs> it literally knocked five minutes off of my time because I was doing it relationally with them, wasn't thinking about what I was doing. And so they met my weakness with gentleness, but not in a way that just said, well, that's all right if you're weak, you just stay that way. It was a way that that helped me grow and get better, not stay in that condition. That is a beautiful example. It can definitely be overwhelming to look at where you want to be and then realize where you are and how far you have to go. Yep. I know for me, sometimes it feels like there's this glass ceiling uh, where I can see clearly where I want to be or what skills I want to have. And I just, I've reached the end of myself. I, yeah. I can't get there in my own strength and it's frustrating, but it's okay. And we're not supposed to do things in our own strength. Part of this journey is, is learning to show grace to yourself. Yeah. Well, you know, somebody who's completely made it and never <laughs> doesn't have any gaps left, you know, I can't really relate to what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> no, yeah. You, know, you get the idea. It's well, like, no, we've all got those gaps, right? And we all have days where like, mm-hmm. I don't even know if this works, right? Yeah. And I have so many friends, you know, I've been in seminary right now doing doing seminary and, and work and trying to balance lots of things. And sometimes I have friends who just look at me and be like, what, you're human? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, realistic expectations. And above all, we just, we need to seek the Lord and he is so good and able and he cares and he knows what we need when we need it. Yeah. So all that to say, um, what are some strategies for people to start where they are? You know, it's okay that you don't just, oh, now I know the answers and I will be perfect or find the perfect community. What are, what are some strategies? Well, I do think that when we come to strategies, it's where it helps to have a sense of where I'm at in my maturity development, because, you know, at Life Model likes to talk about infant, child, adult, parent, and elder level maturity. If you think about it in those cases, an infant can't do anything for themselves. So they kind of need somebody to invite them into a group, you know, create the group, invite them in and get this thing started. And that's okay. So some of us are places where I'm isolated. I've been living in isolation. I just, I wish somebody would, you know, create this for me. Well, part of the maturity process is taking the next step to create something for yourself and not wait for somebody to do this for you. So I would say that part of your growth journey is going to be um, finding ways to build a little bit of joy into every relationship that you have. And looking for ways to, uh, we put it this way, you want to be the sort of person who, when people see you coming, they go, my problems are about to get smaller, (laughs) not my problems are about to get bigger. And so one of the things that some of us that, you know, if we're stuck at infant level maturity, we we have trouble with is that we show up wanting people, wanting it to be all about me and all about my problems. And so sometimes we are too quick to dump on people all of our problems instead of coming like, I want to find a way to add joy so that you leave being happy that I came and how you do that. And it's just, you know, in a way that you contribute something that uh, is positive. So those are skills that we need to kind of work on and, and growing. So our next step in some cases, it really depends on where you're at. For some people, it's going to be, adding adding a little bit of joy in every 
every connection that they have. For others, it's going to be, you need to go join a group, even if it's not a great one. Just get in a group someplace. And then what you want to do is add joy to the group. You want to be as vulnerable as, you know, seems appropriate at that, in that group level and make sure that you're meeting people's things with empathy. So I, I, I think there's, there's the next steps here. Um, for some people, if I'm like an adult parent or elder, I may want to start a group. And so when it comes to, to some of us too, realizing that our group options aren't limited just to our local church, that we can think bigger than that. It's okay to have my people who are part of my local church and that's a good thing, and I want that. But I can also, especially in this internet age, I can have other other people, and I can make connections online. So we encourage people to consider journey groups if they can't. You know, well, that costs some money, but it's still a an option for people who can't find what they're looking for locally and don't know how to go about creating it yet. So those are kind of the options. I can uh, I can. Just start where I'm at and try to make my relationships a little bit better. I can do something online. I can I can join a group. I can start a group. Those are kind of the next options, depending on where I'm at in my own personal journey. Sure. That's a long answer. There we are. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for your in-depthness. Um, any, any final thoughts to conclude today's episode? Well, the word that keeps coming up in my mind is just catalyst, right? And that is if you want to catalyze your growth, if you want to if you really want to see changes as you're going deeper in your walk with God, you have to have this, right? You can't just, it's like a tomato trying to grow, but it's in really lousy soil. We want to, we have to have this enriched soil. So that means I need to take some next steps. I need to find some ways to get connected because if I'm trying to do the Christian life in isolation, um, at best, it's going to be a lot of, a lot of hard work. And uh, at worst, I'm going to just find myself discouraged and quitting. Mm -hmm. So isolation kills. We definitely want uh, uh, to engage. And even if it takes a little bit of a sacrifice, it's a good idea to to make sure that you uh, participate in some type of a group activity like that. Anyway, this episode, Living in the Spirit, um, the doctrine of the Holy Spirit is a topic we could spend many, many episodes on. For today, we are going to look at some key principles and practices for what it looks like to walk in the Spirit. You've said, trying to live the Christian life in the flesh is a bit like a Jedi going into a fight and deciding not to use the Force. I mean, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's um, like, forget the Force. I'm just going to beat this guy with my fist, right? Yeah, no, right? it doesn't. Yeah, okay. Um, but while that's an apt analogy, we also want to be very clear that the Holy Spirit is not just some force. He's not the force, right? Yes. It's not a synonym. He is a person. He's God, and we can have an intimate relationship with him um, that's not just power related. And one of the keys to our walk with God is seeking and relying on his wisdom. So, um, I'm excited to look today at one of my favorite of your acrostics, Slow. Um, at Deeper Walk, we have a fabulous community we call Trailblazers who have committed to donate monthly $25 or more to support the ministry of Deeper Walk. And I bring this up because um, something we do for new Trailblazers, that's my impression we're still doing that, um, is we'll send them a keychain. And on one side of the key, it says, slow, right. stop, listen, obey, or watch. And yeah, do you want to explain what this acrostic is or give a story? Oh, sure. So... The reason that slow is out there is slow. I, I need to back up here, but I'll just say what slow is and then I'll give the okay, story. Okay. So slow is, it stands for um, seek, listen, obey, watch. So S-L-O-W, seek, listen, obey, watch. Sometimes I use stop instead of seek, but it's the idea of stop and seek. Mm -hmm. So um, this acrostic was developed because I was looking for a way to explain what it looked like to walk in the spirit instead of the flesh. And so I would go to like Paul's writings where he says, so I tell you, walk in the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. And I'm like, great. So this next paragraph is going to explain how to do that. Right. And it wouldn't, he would just go on to another topic. And I was starting to get frustrated with Paul, honestly. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> I'm like, Hey, why don't you explain this for those of us who don't intuitively know what it means to walk in the spirit. And, uh, but he said it like everybody knew what he was talking about. So you got to backfill from there. What is he talking about walking in the spirit? So having spent a lot of my time in Old Testament, 
one of the things you notice in the Old Testament is that those people who are wise are often described as being filled with the Spirit of God. Uh, now, sometimes it's Spirit of the Elohim in Hebrew, so people like Spirit of the gods is sometimes how it's translated. But I think the idea is that the Spirit of God inside someone tends to refer to the idea of wisdom. Thus, we have Bezalel and Aholiab, who were the you know architect and engineers of the tabernacle. It says they were filled with the Spirit of God. Daniel was filled with the Spirit of God, and so he was able to give wisdom about what they should do. Joseph was filled with the Spirit of God, so he had wisdom about how to handle the upcoming famine and that sort of thing. So we see this routinely in the Old Testament that when it wants to emphasize the idea of being filled, right, and it is talking about now having wisdom from God about what to do. Well, we see the same thing in the New Testament, and that is Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, proclaims on the day of Pentecost the explanation of what everybody is seeing. Uh, when And began to think, well, let's look for continuity between Old and New Testament and not try to pit them against one another. And if you're looking for continuity, you understand that what the New Testament calls walking in the Spirit, the Old Testament calls wisdom, right? And that those two things are essentially synonymous. The other thing I noticed in the Old Testament was that when they use the expression that the Spirit came upon someone, that was usually for power. So when the Spirit came upon Samson, for example, right, Samson didn't suddenly become wise, right? He became powerful, and he was able to defeat his enemies. Uh, and we see this routinely in the book of Judges, that the Spirit of God comes upon somebody, and, the, and then power is the result. And throughout the Old Testament, it's a, re, a routine reference. Now, I don't think it's 100%, but it's pretty close, right? It's like almost always, those are the distinctions between them. In the same way, when the Spirit is coming upon someone, right, when Jesus says to the apostles, wait for the Spirit to come upon you, then you will receive power, is the idea. So we see both of those things happening. So my, my basic gist here is that wisdom is primarily the relational element of this, and that is that I'm walking with God relationally, and in that relationship, he grants me wisdom to know which way I should go. As the Old Testament says, you'll hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. Whereas when I am walking in the Spirit, I am much more likely to see the power of the Spirit flow. And I think that the power of the Spirit tends to flow primarily in the area of our giftedness. So for me, that tends to be more in teaching, right? So that, and I regularly find myself when I'm teaching, saying things I wasn't planning to say and going, that feels like a God thought. And uh, sometimes when I'm teaching, I will find myself talking to myself, like, you know, you need to listen to what you're saying right now. And that's sort of this God thought where he's, he, the, the power of what's happening is happening through your gift. And so people who have, some people have a gifting that is more oriented towards healing or more oriented towards mirac the miraculous and things like that. And thus they'll tend to see uh, um, that power in those contexts more, more regularly. So that's the idea uh, behind, that was a long answer to slow, right? Oh, but, I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was even thinking as you were talking, um, uh, I just kept hearing with, with wisdom, that wisdom is doing things with God. It is. And that would be the other Old Testament word that you hear a lot. In fact, I, when I was in seminary, I heard a sermon called the withness of God. <laughs> and it's this idea that throughout scripture, how often did God say, I am with you? right? And that him being with us was the key to all of it. Well, through the Holy Spirit living in us, God is with us all of the time. And so those two ideas are definitely connected. Huzzah. How, how can we um, know that what we are hearing is God? Like, you know, the, how, how do we, how can we recognize our wisdom versus God's wisdom versus, oh, my father's pretty wise and he's telling me something. And is that from God? <laughs> yeah, no, that is a tricky thing. I know a lot of people whose lives have been derailed because they thought they were hearing from God. In fact, if you go to a most psych wards, you're going to hear a lot of people who are convinced they're hearing from God. Uh, and I know people who've ended their marriages because a pastor told them, God told me you're supposed to divorce your husband. I mean, yeah, there's a, a need for, for discernment. And so when we're talking about wisdom, it might help to define it. And that is from, a, again, from an Old Testament perspective, wisdom is starts with discernment. And discernment is the ability to distinguish what's good for me and what's bad for me. And so as a parent, we want to teach our kids, right? You know, discernment, don't touch that stove, that would be bad for you, right? You know, don't eat that, that would be bad for you. We, we uh, 
and so our goal is we want good things for people. And so you have to learn discernment about what's going to lead to good and what's going to lead to bad. Well, the problem, of course, is that life is so complicated that we can't possibly know everything. And no one person can have all of the wisdom that they need for life. And so God does that on purpose, I think, because he wants us relationally to connect with him to get his wisdom and his guidance. Now, the frustrating thing about that is that he often doesn't do it the way we want him to. So if I'm saying, should I marry this person? Should I uh, go to this school? Should I, what is the will of God for me? Should I, you know, am I supposed to do this or do that? I find that he often doesn't answer those directly. And part of that is because he wants me to walk through the process with him. And in the end, he'll get me where I need to be. But sometimes there's just a process to it. And I'm just, my problem is impatience, you know, that I want, I want it now and I want it immediately. And I want the instant gratification of being able to stop and hear God right now and know exactly what I'm supposed to do. And for a lot of us, I think the reason that that's a problem is that we're doing it out of fear that if I don't hear from God, I'm going to get this wrong and then everything's going to fall apart. And we're trying to use walking in the spirit as a way to be perfect. And I found that I can walk in the spirit and still make mistakes. Right? And that is, this is not a recipe for how to be perfect and get everything right all of the time. And so we need to, I, I heard uh, Bill Gillum years ago, uh, he, he wrote Lifetime Guarantee and, and had some uh, good exchange life teaching. And he said, you know, it's possible to walk in the spirit and still burn the eggs, right? <laughs> you might hear the spirit say, you know, make, make breakfast for your family this morning. Well, you can still mess that up, even though you heard from God correctly. So this is... I think it's we need to have the freedom to realize that we're not talking about an expectation of perfection and that if you get this part of Christianity right, you'll never make a mistake again. So I think it's important to understand that, too. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm also just dwelling on um, I feel like you used to to teach slow more as stop, listen, obey, and you have started teaching it more as seek, listen, obey. And I think some of that comes from what context you're in. So stop would be more in a moment of temptation. Right. Stop and listen. Um, versus seeking as a lifestyle. And so, um, yeah, and that came from my own experience, right? That is, uh, I grew up in a church that could be described as, you know, Father, Son, and Holy Bible, right? It was that kind of church much more than, uh, I certainly didn't grow up in the charismatic world. I wasn't, uh, um, and the idea that God wanted to speak to me, honestly, in my theology uh, as a teenager, and even early in my 20s was that, I didn't ever expect to hear from God in my entire life. And that if I did maybe once, maybe twice about something really important, but this idea that I should have a, a conversational walk with God, a listening walk with God wasn't on the radar. My, my picture of wisdom was study the Bible and the Bible will fill you and that will make you wise. And there's some truth to that, right? Because the Holy Spirit did author the scripture and it does give us a worldview that helps us, you know, discern things and, recognize what's going on. And I think that we're our next session, we're going to be talking about the role of scripture in, uh, in helping us walk in the spirit. But uh, the problem is that when you're only using the scripture and you don't have the Holy Spirit involved, then it's like a plane that's only got one wing. <laughs> you know, it's probably not, you're just going to go in circles a lot. I also think that, um, I think the original question was, how do you know the difference? Yeah. Right. Discernment, so, testing, all that. So there's a couple of things on discernment. Uh, the first one I point to is that you can discern whether or not the Holy Spirit is leading you because it will always lead you to the fruit of the Spirit. So if you sense God is telling you to do something, but it's directly contrary to the fruit of the Spirit, then you know that's not God. So if he's saying, you know, be impatient and yell at this person, right? That's not coming from God. If it's uh, don't show self-control, right? You know, just indulge yourself. That's not coming from God. If it's a... Uh, uh, if it's something that's leading you to not be loving, right, or to not uh, express that, then it, there's if there's no peace in it. And when we say peace, I want to be careful about this too, because it, it uh, there's a lot of counterfeit things in the new age that give people peace, that can give people euphoria, that can give people a feeling of ecstasy, like, oh, this has to be God because I feel so good. Um, what we're talking about more is that I have a peace that this is the sort of thing God would want me to do. And part of the way that I know that is that I know scripture, but part of the way that I, 
recognize that is that this this prompting that I'm getting, yeah, if you can kind of tell this is the right thing to do and there's a piece about it, like, yeah, this is the right thing to do. So we start with simple ones, right? And like I was uh, very upset with your mother once. <laughs> <laughs> I know you've never seen us upset with each other, but uh, no, it's a, uh, and I, when I get upset, I tend to shut down. And so when I shut down in this case, I got in the car and I was running an errand in my mind, I'm just like chewing her out. I'm so upset and I'm feeling very justified in my anger and very justified in, in where I'm at. And all of a sudden there's this random other thought that comes into my head which was, you're just having a pity party. Well, you know, that didn't fit the narrative that was, <laughs> you know, that was going on in there. And I took it as the Holy, as a Holy Spirit thought, because I'm like, well, what, what would happen if I follow that line of thinking? So I'm like, all right. And it stopped me in my tracks because it was kind of a surprising thought. And I realized, yeah, what I'm doing is I'm feeding my flesh. And it's pretty clear in a situation like this, which one's the spirit and which one's the flesh, because you're talking about, you know, which path does God, was going to make God happier, which one is clearly a more loving thing to do. And I find that most of the stuff that we're talking about when it comes to walking in the flesh, walking in the spirit is that sort of thing. It is, this, this path is clearly more in line with what God would want for our lives. Um, it's the other ones that... Uh, I would also jump in on there and say, you know, I think that there is a tone to God's voice that um, he says things gently or like he, he, he might say something very hard nosed or, you know, it could be said with a condemning tone. But I, in my experience, when he has convicted me of something or, you know, mm -hmm. it hasn't been a ew kind of feeling it has, you know, even if it's something that makes me go, oh, man you know, yeah, I need to change this or, you know, or whatever. It, I, I don't feel, I know it's God who's convicting me of it because I, I feel peace about the fact that I'm yeah. being convicted about it. <laughs> There's no question about it. And I would say that um, most of the time when I know it's God, it's corrective, mm -hmm. right? That's one of the ways I know it's God is because I'm in my flesh. I'm going down this road and I get this random thought that is not in sync. And the, and so it startles me into, wait a second, uh, you know, I need correction here. But every time that I felt that correction, even though it's been, it's been like a healthy shame message, um, I have left feeling like you will be happier with you so, yourself if you do it this way. Yes. It's not a toxic shame message. <clears throat> it's not, it's not like if you have one bird on your shoulder feeding your angsty yeah. thoughts, um, it's not another bird coming and saying, how dare you have these bad thoughts or, you know, right. you're just having a pity party in that way. It's, it's, it's well, not a sh toxic shame. It's a healthy corrective. Right. Yeah. yeah. And that's what happened, you know, in that case too. So by the time I got back from that errand, mm -hmm. you know, I was in a much better place and I was able to, you know, have a very different conversation than I would have had. And, uh, you know, the evening turned out a whole lot better too. So you know, we have, uh, uh, so all those things help. So that's one way that we know it's the spirit is that it will lead to the fruit of the spirit. That's my first test. If you got to take it to the next level, too, um, there are some things that are just purely not scriptural. And you like, you know, you need to divorce your wife and marry this other person in the church. Well, that, you know, that's clearly not God. That's not scriptural. And then there's also um, direct testing. And uh, the direct testing is this idea, um, especially when it gets into spiritual experiences, because almost everything the Holy Spirit does, the devil can counterfeit. And so because of that, we have to test experiences. I'll give you an example of this. I got an email one time from a, uh, a missionary, and there were nine teenage kids in this church who were all slain in the spirit at the front of their church and simultaneously had exactly the same vision. Now, on the surface, that would sound like, well, if that's not the Holy Spirit, what is, right? You know, the Holy Spirit gives them a dramatic experience in a church, you know, with a special evangelist there whose, you know, gift is having people experience the Holy Spirit and they have the exact same vision, you know, how can that not be the Holy Spirit? Well, that's fine until you hear the, the vision. And the vision was essentially teaching pure legalism. And what they did is they visited heaven, they visited hell. And what they, what they saw was, uh, for example, Christians who enjoyed Christian rock music were burning in hell, right? The uh, Christians who danced were burning in hell, right? It was just going through the straight, uh, legalism. So I, I sent back a, a message to the missionary and I said, 
can you think of a better way to start a cult than to give somebody a supernatural experience like this that everybody, nobody questions? And now they say, well, we all know what God wants now, right? We all know the right thing because cults are characterized by believing that there's one person who's got a special connection with God that nobody else has. And we all have to submit to what that one person hears from God. Well, that's really dangerous. You know, and even Jesus left 12 apostles, not just one. And one of the reasons I think there's 12 apostles and not just one is that there was no one voice that said, everybody submit to this one person. Well, we even see in the scriptures, Peter and Paul having <laughs> corrective conversations. Like, well, Yeah, we do. Yeah. And I think that's all for our edification and our benefit, because um, it's not meant to be. Uh, it, it, once you start getting this idea that only one voice is the final arbiter of all things that are true, you're, you're starting to go down this slippery slope to something very cult-like. So we do test the spirits and, uh, um, you know, in other ways we test the spirits are sometimes with direct tests and a direct test would be somebody who's had a supernatural experience and wants to test it to see if it was legit. Um, you just say something like what we call an if prayer, like if this is the Holy spirit, then I thank you for the experience, and I ask you, God, that it will bear great fruit in my life. But if I have been deceived, and that was not the Holy Spirit, it was a counterfeit, then I renounce that experience in Jesus' name, and I command that spirit to leave. Well, I've I've done this probably, you know, I don't know, 30 to 50 times with people in my, my life, and I'd say right now it's about 50-50. How many of them are the Holy Spirit? It's really the Holy Spirit. And how many times they were actually deceived by something and it was a counterfeit religious experience. And I say that because the Holy Spirit is not offended by that test, right? The Holy Spirit has never said, how dare you think that I might be a demon, right? And it's like, no, it's like, yeah, you did what the Bible told you to do. You tested the spirits and no, this is me. We're all good. And everything went forward and that person was bearing fruit in their lives. But we have had people who've had counterfeit tongues. They've had counterfeit miracles. They've had counterfeit, uh, you know, religious visions. They've had, you know, counterfeit all kinds of uh, things, psychic abilities. And, you know, they're claiming to be prophets, but they're actually not. They were actually getting things from a demonic spirit. So we, we do test these things because um, some people have never heard that they can be counterfeited. And so they just assume that because it's happening in a church, it must be God. It must be the Holy Spirit. So it's one of the reasons why we do blend the, the spiritual warfare training with our walking in the spirit training to try to bring balance to this and make sure that we don't get deceived. That's really good. And wow, I can't believe we're already at the top of our time here. There's so much. Like, like I said at the beginning of the episode, we could have many, many episodes just on doctrine of the Holy Spirit and such. There's no question so, about it. Yeah. Um, I encourage you to get the book, A Deeper Walk, and <laughs> read more about this. But um, for now, Father, do you have any other things that you wanted to, wanted to make sure you touched on in this episode? Well, yeah. I mean, the the main thing, when, as I started to say earlier, that I did not grow up in a church that taught this stuff. So my journey, one of the reasons that this fluctuates between stop, listen, obey, watch and seek, listen, obey, is that I learned the process as stop, listen, obey, because I learned it in a temptation context. And that is when you're tempted, stop and listen, right? There'll be a still small voice inside. That was the advice a pastor gave me. And so that's how I started my journey. And I realized that that was that worked. that I often got surprising thoughts. Now, there've been times when I was tempted and I stopped and listened. I didn't hear anything. Um, but usually if I stopped long enough, I knew what it was God wanted me to do. Even though I didn't hear anything, there was like this knowing, like, I, you know, I know he doesn't want me to, you know, go do this mm -hmm. stuff. So there's a, there, which brings us to two kinds of listening. And I'll just wrap up with this. And that is, we call it right brain listening, left brain listening. Left brain is what most of us expect. And that is that I'm going to get a clear, distinct thought in my mind that is obviously the Holy Spirit. Or I'm going to actually have an audible voice or a vision or a dream or something that's going to tell me what to do. Well, that's more left brain hearing. It's where God interrupts us and just makes it clear this is what's going on. Most of the time, I think that our, our listening is right brain. So just like right now, you and I can look into each, in each other's eyes and, and we can read each other's body language. And I can kind of tell it's like, it's time to wrap up right now. <laughs> but I'm also, this is good. I don't want to cut it off. You know, you can, there's a lot you can read just from body language, right? And, and I'm looking at this, like most of our communication is, is nonverbal. Well, I would call the right brain listening that nonverbal 
communication with God where we don't hear something per se, but we know what it is God wants us to do. And there's more of a, a sense of knowing or a sense of peace that I'm, I'm on the right track. I just need to keep going where I'm going. And so I would just uh, encourage people that there's more ways to hear God than just having him interrupt your life with some sort of a vision or a, a clear word or something like that. There's a, more of our daily walk with God is, is that right brain kind of connecting with God where we begin to intuit what uh, we sense he's leading us to do. That's awesome. I also uh, feel led to just give a plug to Don Whitestone's book, yeah. Strategic Business Prayer. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it is good for more than just business. So yeah, it is. <laughs> look it up. <laughs> well, yeah, the strategic business prayer book she wrote actually is, uh, first it teaches you how to do listening prayer and then it applies it to business. So if you're just interested in how to do listening prayer, it's still one of the better resources out there on how to do it. Yeah. Very good. And last episode, we were talking about living in the spirit Yes, and your acrostic slow, seek, listen, obey, and watch. As we move into talking about scripture, I wonder if you could talk more about where you see slow applied in the Bible. Sure. Or, yeah. So one of the, the first things that jumped out at me is uh, the book of Joshua. And Joshua had a lot of battles to fight. And I look at, so I look at Joshua as a really good paradigm for the victorious Christian life. And the victorious Christian life is the idea that we will have battles to fight. But if God, if it's a battle God wants us to fight and God is in it, there is always a path to victory. And so the question is, how, what is that path to victory? And, and God lays it out for Joshua at the beginning. And he said, you know, be strong and courageous and obey. So obedience was the key to victory for him. Well, how did he know what to obey? And you realize that for every battle that Joshua fought, he had to stop, seek God, listen to what God wanted, and then obey that. And then he got to watch what happened. He also got to watch what happened when he didn't stop, right? And he didn't seek God. Because if I don't stop and I don't seek God, then I can't listen. And that happened to Joshua with the Gibeonites who came and they pretended to be from a distant country. And he did not stop and seek the Lord on what to do. And that was the one time he got into big trouble because he didn't stop and and seek the Lord so he wasn't able to listen and obey, and we watched what happened. Now, even that was redeemed, though, because when they went to the uh, to Ai, they went to the, the I'm sorry, the battle where the sun stood still, with the where they went to defend the Gibeonites. Uh, Joshua definitely sought the Lord on what his strategy should be for that battle, and so even in spiritual warfare situations with people, I've often told them, let's stop and ask God for His strategy for this battle that we're in. And that's uh, so that's where that came from. And as we see it illustrated there nicely, I think, in Joshua, somebody who was his whole campaign was based on stop, seek the Lord, listen to what he has to say and obey, then watch what happens and go forward. It also reminds me of Jesus's words where he says, watch and pray so that you don't fall into temptation, because I think it sort of completes the cycle Uh that as I'm living a life of watching and praying, I'm more you know likely to recognize that it's time for me to stop and seek the Lord. I can give you one more while yes. I'm on this because it's like the uh, the Torah. Uh, the Torah is anchored in the creation story. And so we see God creating stars and sun and moon, you know, the moon to rule the night, the sun to rule the day. And then the stars remind us of seasons. Well, that word seasons is the same word that the Torah used for, for its festival season. Right? It's time for tabernacles. It's time for Passover. It's time for this, you know, whatever the festival was. And so one of the things that we see is that in the Torah, tabernacle and then temple worship was anchored in ever, a morning sacrifice and an evening sacrifice, which is related, I think, to sunrise and sunset. And I th- can't get over the idea that sunrises and sunsets are beautiful because they're calls to worship and they're reminders. Stop and seek me, right? Let's spend some time together. And then every week there was a Sabbath and on Sabbath they did a double sacrifice, And then once a month, there was a new moon. And every new moon, there was a double sacrifice. And then there were, uh, you know, week-long festivals where you weren't supposed to work. In fact, it totaled up one time that if you took off every day that the Torah tells you to take off, 70 days a year were vacation days, right? That's pretty good. And uh, literally, you know, we talk about a 10% tithe of money, but there was a 20% tithe of time. And so we see that that resting was actually an act of worship to God to take the time off and to trust that he would take care of you, even if you didn't work yourself to death. 
And I think how much better our lives would be if we actually took the time to rest that the Bible puts in there and to stop what we're doing and seek the Lord on this regular basis. So there's sort of this calendar reminder, stop and seek me, listen to what I have to say, and then obey and watch what happens and see if you don't see more peace in your life. That's beautiful. So beautiful. Oh man, I love I love your perspective on the Old Testament and and yes, thank you for your contagious love of the Old Testament. I'm in biblical studies masters right now and yeah, I'm going to be doing an exegesis of Joshua next semester and I'm just very excited. But Yeah, you've got some great props down there too, so <laughs> it should be a good good time. I'm looking forward to get gleaning from what you're learning. So <laughs> Yes, I love it. Someday I would love to have a series just digging one episode at a time into your biblical theology overview. That would be cool. Um, but right now we're going to fire hose. We are fire hosing so, it today. All right. Um, your biblical theology overview around here is known as www.plaxon.com. <laughs> Do you think you can give a brief overview? Well, first of all, www.plaxn, yes. right? It's the word plan with an X in it. Plaxn.com is an active website. You can actually go there. Um, I don't know what it takes you to, but it's an active <laughs> website. I haven't been there in a while. But it's a uh, uh, the idea here is that there are nine building blocks of biblical theology that every Christian really ought to know and to understand. So when I was in seminary, we used to have this discussion of, is there a central theme to the Bible? And some people are like, well, it's Jesus. And some will say, well, it's the kingdom of God, or it's the promise that was given. And there were all kinds of ideas, or it's God's eternal purpose in creation. A lot of people have had ideas about what's the centerpiece. So out of that, uh, I, I used to argue that the center, if there's a centerpiece, the idea is worship. And that is that God created us to walk with him. So if you define worship as walking with God, and that his purpose in creation was to have a family that would be relationally connected with one another and relationally connected to him, and that's what worship is, that we express our worship to God through our connection with him and we and through loving our neighbor. And so we that is how we walk with God. So walking with God is about trusting him and obeying him and then growing more intimate with him in this process of trusting him, knowing him, obeying him as we know trust and obey God. It just this cycle continues that just gets us deeper and deeper. So coming out of that in our discussions of seminary was this idea that there is something called creation theology and that is lessons that are anchored in the fact that God is creator. Uh, lessons anchored in the fact that this is how God designed the world, and this is sort of foundational to understanding the worldview of Scripture. And so the the www of these uh, um, building blocks are all related to what we might call creation theology, and they are lessons that uh, uh, apply to all humanity and in all places. And the www, the first one is worship, and worship as walking with God, the idea that God's purpose for creation was to create a people who would have a relationship with him and walk with him. And so God created paradise. And we get glimpses of this now and then because we have these moments in our lives where we're like, ah, oh, life just can't get any better than this. And, and it's a glimpse of that paradise God created us for. But as we all know, we don't live in paradise, right? We live in uh, uh, paradise has been lost, as uh, <laughs> someone famously said. In our... Uh, um, we live in a fallen world that is at war. So the second W is warfare and that you cannot understand this reality unless you understand that we live in a world at war. And this takes us directly to the problem of suffering and evil in the world. And that is that this planet, God, Jesus said when he was here, he called the devil the prince of this world, right? That the world is under the influence of the evil one. So the evil one is free to roam the world. So, and there is evil that is free to happen. And I heard a pastor years ago say, God allows evil, but he uses evil and he overcomes it. So he clearly allows evil because it's happening uh, a lot. He uses evil. We see this in, in Joseph, who uh, was evilly you know, sent to, into slavery, was evilly sent to prison, right? was evilly left there too long. But God used the evil that happened and put him in just the right position to create a redemption story. And then he overcame it by raising Joseph from the dead, so to speak, and giving him this place uh, of uh, glory. We see this in Job. We see it in Jesus. We see it in Esther. We see this in stories all through the scripture. 
So there's the idea that God created the world for worship and created paradise, but that we live in warfare. We can't understand life until we understand that we are born into a world at war. And so to help us in this fallen world at war, we get to the third W, and that's wisdom. And it's this idea that there is a universal wisdom that we all are called to, that God said, life is too complicated for you to figure it all out, so let me make this simple for you. Trust me. Right. So that's why we get to like Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean out on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. He'll make your path straight. And that word acknowledge is yada, right? It's the Hebrew word that means, can be translated to be intimate with. Thus, it says, Adam, yada, Eve, and she got pregnant, right? So you have this intimacy idea that God says, in all your ways, be intimate with me, and I'll make your path straight. So that brings us right back to the S-L-O-W, like seek, listen, obey, watch. So the WWW of this, we'll just start here, is anchored in this idea of creation theology, lessons that come from the nature of the world, our worldview of how we look at what's going on in the world, and that God wants us to know that that there is a wisdom that will guide us into a path that ends in his blessing, even though we live in a world that's fallen. So if we want to get on that path that leads to what is good, God says, well, trust me, obey me, and that path will end in what, you know, will end in blessing. So those are the first three. This next part, the plan, uh, I remember you teaching my fifth grade Sunday school class. We would use our hands yep. and you would walk us all through it. And so this is simple enough for fifth graders. <laughs> yeah, we can are you smarter than a fifth grader is our second title <laughs> for this. Yes. So uh if you can do this, so if you want, is that you take your right hand, you turn it towards your face, you start with your pinky, and you go two thousand, fifteen hundred, one thousand five hundred, zero for so you got five hundred year intervals between each finger. Now there is no zero BC or zero AD. It's actually one BC goes to one AD, but I use zero just to keep. So if it's confusing to you, you change it to whatever you want. So we got two thousand, fifteen hundred, one thousand five hundred, and Jesus at the zero <laughs> marker there. So let me. I'll just ask you, right? Because you know this stuff, right? So the uh, the uh, so which famous Bible character was alive in the year two thousand? Abraham. Very good. And which famous character was alive in 1500? Moses. And in 1000? David. There you go. See, she knew this since fifth grade. And then uh, <laughs> the, uh, and so my pointer finger is not a person. It's a, it's the, it's exile. the exile. And then the thumb, of course. is Jesus. It's Jesus. That's your <laughs> uh, standard Sunday school answer. So we have Abraham, Moses, David, and Jesus. Now what those four characters all have in common is that God had a covenant associated with each one of them. So if we think about covenants in today's world, covenant is like a, uh, like a wedding or marriage covenant. And so we think of rings as the symbol of those. So what we like to do is put a ring on each one of those covenant fingers, Abraham, Moses, David. So we call it the Abrahamic covenant, the Mosaic covenant, the Davidic covenant. You know, and Then Jesus brings the new covenant. So the first one, we go back to 2000 BC and uh, Abraham, the Abrahamic covenant is regularly called the promise. And so that is the P of plan, promise. The Mosaic covenant is called the law. So that's the L of plan. And then the covenant with David was the promise of an anointed one who was coming. So the Greek for anointed one is Christ or Christos. The uh, uh, Hebrew is Mashiach, from which we get Messiah. So you have Christ the Messiah, the anointed one who's coming, and uh, that he's promised to come through the line of David. So we have PLA, promise, law, anointed one. And then we have exile, and then we have new covenant. So if you just take the four covenants, it spells plan, P-L-A-N, promise, law, anointed one, new covenant. Look at that. Look at that. Who knew? I think God set that up, Joe. It was like there. <laughs> and God the idea to make you smile. Yeah, just to make me smile. So God's plan for the world was... Uh, to bring his son to be the, the the promised seed through whom all nations on earth would be blessed. So the promise is sometimes called the gospel preached ahead of time in the Old Testament, and that is this promise. And I find it interesting that this promise was given in one, one of the settings in which it was given was called the binding of Isaac, where Abraham binds Isaac, puts him on the altar, and they just kind of role play the whole thing that Jesus, the promised seed, is going to do that will bring salvation to the world and thus bring blessing to all nations on earth. And today, in every nation on earth, there are Christians, right? Which is, so we've seen this fulfillment of this, this promise already. Do you want to touch on ed, the exile's role within the plan? Yeah, that's, uh, you know, the exile is the one non-person, right? And uh, what's interesting, it 
when I was studying uh, in seminary and was really diving into the theology of the exile, there are two passages that stood out that both referred to the exile as divorce. I'm like, that got my attention. It says, God gave faithless Israel her certificate of divorce and sent her away. I'm like, wait, God's divorced? You know, is that what this is? And so it brings up this question, well, when did he get married? Well, that takes us back to the law, right? The law of Moses, uh, sometimes I'll get it this way, that the promise is a little bit like an engagement, and the uh, it's when they were betrothed. And then the law is when they actually got married. So there's this marriage covenant at Mount Sinai where Moses is presiding. He says, do you, Yahweh, take Israel <laughs> to be your people? Really? You know, yeah, you know, the idea. And then uh, uh, Israel is like, do you take Yahweh to be your God, forsaking all others? And, you know, they say, yes, they enter into a blood covenant. So there is blood that is sprinkled on the altar to represent Yahweh coming into the covenant. There is uh, blood sprinkled on the people. You know, uh, probably you can get to all of them, but you know the idea, of, so this uh, idea that they are both brought into this covenant, and the prophets referred to it as a marriage that they had gotten married. But I like to say that they, that Israel essentially committed adultery on their honeymoon. Um, you know, right there at Mount Sinai, uh, Israel was worshiping the golden calf. Uh, later in the desert, they were worshiping the Baal of Peor, um, and the imagery of idolatry and adultery were just linked all through Israel's history. We actually see an interesting uh, picture of this in the life of Solomon, right? And that is that Solomon, like Israel, God spoke to Solomon, just as God had spoken to Israel. And Solomon built a temple to where at the centerpiece of this temple was the Holy of Holies, where the ark was that has the law inside. And the first commandment of the law is no other gods beside me. So just shortly after Solomon builds the temple, right, saying, I'm going to worship Yahweh. This is his temple on the earth. No other gods besides him. What's he do, right? His wives, foreign wives, convince him to permit the worship of their gods. Soon he's building shrines to them. And so Solomon is, just like Israel had done, is breaking the covenant. He is uh, he is committing spiritual adultery, and the penalty for that is exile. And we see a glimpse of this because God took 10 of the, the tribes away from Solomon and gave them to somebody else. And that's a foreshadowing or picture of, it, of, of Israel's exile. And then we see this just building and building, and, and uh, you realize that God had every right to send them into exile much sooner than he did, but it was his patience and his mercy So finally, he sends them in exile, which leads both Ezekiel and Jeremiah, who are the prophets when the Babylonian exile occurs, it leads both of them to foretell a new covenant that is going to come that will, in a sense, replace the law. It'll take the the new covenant will surpass that one. And then Hebrews in the New Testament does a really good job of unpacking uh, how that all works. So the exile is important because it sets the stage for why a new covenant was necessary. And then the new covenant, I like to say, is not only the thing that that replaces the, the law, but it fulfills the promise to Abraham. It fulfills the promise to David. So it brings all of these covenants together in one, and it's the fulfillment of all of them. So exile kind of ties all these covenants together in a, in a pretty unique way. Yeah, I guess so. I, I don't think I've ever <laughs> actually... Um, thought about the foreshadowing in Solomon before. That's really cool. Yeah. <laughs> I learn something new from you all the time. I well, love it. You know, in one of our books on uh, Deeper Walk Guide to the Bible, we have a segment on the exile, that chapter, and there kind of camps out on Solomon. I call it the slippery slope to exile. It's yeah. got its own acrostic to it and everything. Yeah, yeah. Shocking. But yeah, no, it's a, it, it, it was one of those things that jumped out at me when I was studying the Old Testament intensely back in the kind of early days yeah. of ministry. Yeah, well, and the 10 tribes and the... Ah. I've forgotten, apparently. So do you want to do any more on New Covenant, or do you want to talk about .com? Yeah, uh, let me, uh, let's go into .com and make sure we get there. And then, uh, uh, because, well, the New Covenant is the covenant of grace as opposed to law, right? And then we, when we get to .com, .com is a little bit different because it's C-O-M stands for coming of Messiah. Mm-hmm. And so we look at it this way. We talked about creation theology and the WWW. I call the plan, you know, salvation theology, um, which, you know, is, is most people are very familiar with. And then dot com is represents kingdom theology. And it's this idea that the kingdom has come in Christ and thus we are living in the last days. But until this present evil age ends, 
right? We're still, you know, we're still waiting. So we're in this already not yet period of the kingdom, that the kingdom is already here spiritually. It is not yet here physically. And so when uh, Christ does return, that will be the coming of Messiah. That's when this present evil age ends. It's when he his throne is established in Jerusalem, right? And he literally reigns over the earth. And so all of our uh, prophetic uh, views of uh, of the kingdom were kind of anchored in that that part of the acrostic. One of my favorite aspects of your teaching is how you've helped me understand a biblical worldview. Um, having an accurate understanding of what the world is and how it works and who God is and how we relate to him. To say this is important is an understatement. Um, so I just, I really appreciate that. And I know um, we'll look more at worldview more in depth in a later series. Um, but for now, I'd love for you to talk about the Bible's role in developing and understanding worldview. Just Certainly, in- yeah. I have sometimes uh, say that the at the heart of discipleship is the idea of worldview. Mm-hmm. That culture starts with belonging and that these are my people. And then my people share a common perspective on life. And so most of us, our worldview are our assumptions about life that we never even think about. But when we explore them, uh, worldview encompasses a lot of things, including how do, thing, how do things happen, right? What, what causes things to happen? Like, is there an overarching narrative that fits it all together? And so uh, worldviews are often expressed through the narratives of a culture or the mythology of a culture. So we can, in that sense of how, the role that myth plays in some cultures, we, we look to the Bible as like true mythology, if you will, right? This the... Uh, Right. It's the uh, it's saying this is the actual narrative that we need to have. And so one of the reasons that studying the Bible is so important is that as we internalize scripture, it begins to shape our worldview. And one of the ways that it does that is that the more that I embrace scripture, the more I fill my mind with scripture, the easier it is for me to see life as an extension of the Bible. Right. It gives me the categories by which I evaluate what I'm looking at. If I don't saturate my mind with scripture, if I don't have the, the worldview that comes from uh, Bible study, then I will get my narrative on what's happening from someplace else. And that creates double mindedness and double mindedness right, robs us of peace and creates all these other problems in our lives. So, uh, yeah, hard to overstate how important that is. Yeah, that's perfect. How as we are wrapping up this um, very, very rich content episode, um, can you just leave us with some strategies for interacting with your Bible or memorizing it so that you can start achieving this saturation? Yeah, most people I talk to say, oh, I, I am terrible at memorizing. You're so lucky. They'll tell me you know, that you, the Bible memory is so easy for you. And there's some truth to that, right? I, God gave me a mind that remembers things. Uh, but there is a, uh, uh, I found that like when I was, re- Work in and in something called Bible quizzing when I was young, and it taught me to spend usually ten hours a week or more, where I was taking walks with my Bible and like for an hour a day, sometimes two or three hours in a day. Uh, and I got in the habit of doing this where I would repeat um, a, a phrase at a time to myself, and as soon as I had that phrase down, then and I could say it perfectly three times, and I add a phrase. And then I'd say that one perfectly three times and I put the two of them together, right? And what I found was that generally in about 15 minutes, I could actually memorize three verses. And most people are like, really? And I'm like, well, try it. It's like, so the goal is take 15 minutes on any two verse, three verse segment of scripture and, and see if at the end of that 15 minutes, just through this repetition process, you can't uh, actually recite that. Now, what you'll probably find is the next day you'll forget it. And that's why you have to do it again. But you, And that's why you do this every day. But if you come back to it, what I found uh, when I was really doing this as a, as a major part of life, I found that it was not really that hard to memorize a chapter in a month. And so once you get to that point where you're actually memorizing whole chapters, it's it really begins to reshape your brain, right? It begins to reshape the way that you think and the way that you're looking at life. So I, I say this because most people are intimidated and they don't even try. The other thing I found really helpful was having a partner. So one of the things I did is I, uh, as a retired man, gentleman asked me one time if there was anything he could do to be supportive 
And I said, well, why don't you be my Bible memory partner? And so we got together once a week for an hour and just reviewed all of the, um, all of these things. And it kind of helped keep me anchored and, and, and moving forward. So I encourage Bible memory and encourage Bible study and honestly, Bible reading. And I think one of the problems we have is that too many of us have gotten used to five minute, you know, five minutes of Bible here, five minutes of Bible there. And I think even if we just took Sundays, for example, and said, I'm going to take an hour this Sunday and just read my Bible for an hour, like that would be huge for a lot of us. So um, I, anything, uh, I just want to encourage, you know, people start where you're at and uh, start picking away at this. And you can actually learn a lot more than you think in uh, just by building a habit into your life. Mm-hmm. I would also just encourage, um, if you can, read a whole book at a time. Like, if you can set aside a Sunday and just read a whole book, um, I have found that to be um, very enriching and and you get the whole context of what the book is trying to do um, if you're just reading it straight through. Mm-hmm. And so if on the flip side, of, if you're not doing the memory work, if you're just wanting to saturate your mind with it instead of saying, okay, I got my chapter for the day or I got, you know, my reading. If you could sit down and just read a whole, a whole book, you can start with a smaller book. <laughs> um, but I have found that to be very good and helpful. But thank you, dad. Any final thoughts? We need to wrap up here, but. Well, yeah, we covered a lot of territory, obviously the whole Bible in one podcast, (laughs) but uh, we're uh, hopefully people get the idea that you can't have a deeper walk without, you know, scriptural knowledge. And I I think, uh, I think in the chapter, I end with this story of uh, a missionary who smuggled some Bibles into a closed country and uh, after he made the exchange, he said, so do you want us to come teach? And the person looked back and, you know, kind of with this stunned look on his face, held up the Bible. He says, Bible will teach, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and I think that that's that's part of this. We all need to become, uh, you know, keep growing in our ability to feed ourselves from God's word. Thanks for joining us on the trail today. Did you like this episode? Would you like more people to see it? This is the part where I ask you to like, comment, subscribe, share with a friend. And do you love this channel? One of the best ways that you can support us is by becoming a Deeper Walk Trailblazer. Thanks again. We'll see you back on the trail next week.